I'm really grateful that we get to talk about the refugee crisis, which it still is. It's a global refugee crisis. And if you want to use the interchangeable word migration crisis, you may. It still, in many ways, means the same thing. And we'll tease that out as we go along with our guests as well. This is still an era that we're living in where it is the worst refugee crisis since World War II. That for many of us is our grandparents' generation. It echoes and resonates day to day across multiple continents, across multiple countries. Some rich countries, some poor countries, some countries still at war, some post-war. And every situation is different, every context is different, which makes it all the more intriguing to see if there are solutions that can be followed within countries that can be replicated elsewhere, or if there are some very specific things that are only context specific within particular paradigms or countries. So, I'm delighted to introduce my panel to you today. To my left, we have Her Excellency Mrs. Sadia Omar Farooq, who's the Honorable Minister of the Federal Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management and Social Development for the Federal Republic of Nigeria. It's not often that we get to speak to a, a sitting minister from Nigeria, so ma'am, it's a pleasure having you here with us. To her left, we have Dr. Kerem Kinnik, who's the president of the Turkish Red Crescent. Sir, it is a pleasure having you as well. There's a lot to talk about within this particular country, within Turkey, and it being a country at the heart of the global refugee crisis over the past few years. To his left, we have Gillian Triggs, who's the Assistant High Commissioner for Protection at UNHCR. And the refugee arm of the United Nations is one that has come under a lot of scrutiny over the past few years, and it's many migration and refugee arms as well. And ma'am, as far as I understand, you are also the Assistant Secretary General to Antonio Guterres, so it is an honor having you with us during this discussion. And on the far left, not politically, but just <laughs> to my left here, Kurt Deboeuf, who's a senior associate researcher at the Free University of Brussels. Mr. Deboeuf, pleasure having you with us. And the smartest man in the room, dressed very well. <laughs> let us begin, and let me, let me start to my immediate left with the Honorable uh, Minister. Uh, Ma'am, Nigeria is a country like no other. Uh, not many countries can say that they have more than five million internally displaced people, IDPs, people on the move from multiple crises and conflicts within the borders. And of course, people streaming across the border from places like Cameroon and elsewhere. It probably suggests that you cannot have a single policy and a single solution in a humanitarian sense, in an economic sense, in a political sense. How do you tackle all of this at the same time? Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me start by appreciating the Turkish radio and television for inviting us uh, to this forum. As rightly mentioned, Nigeria is faced with multi-dimensional issues of migration. We have our own uh, complex crisis as a result of the insurgency in a part of the country, which leads to people being displaced, uh, people you know, crossing the borders as refugees to other neighboring countries, and also, as a result of the crisis in the Niger Delta, uh, people get displaced. So for us in Nigeria, we are faced with the mixed migration uh, dimensions, where you have internally displaced persons, you have refugees, you also have returning migrants, or migrants who have crossed the borders to other parts of the world. And uh, for us to address these issues, we have developed our, our frameworks and legal institutions to see that 
this uh, crisis or this mixed migration issues are tackled in a very well coordinated manner. For instance, we have the national uh, migration policy that deals with these issues of migration where we have different thematic areas because uh, this migration issues cuts across other uh, segments of the society or other institutions. And so we have thematic areas where we bring different arms of government, different NTAs to focus on specific uh, thematic areas. This is one aspect that Nigeria really uh, focuses and addresses the issues of uh, mixed migration. We also have the uh, internally displaced uh, policy, the national policy for internal displacement. This also we are addressing in a very coordinated manner with different uh, uh, thematic areas, different MDAs uh, focusing on their own areas of responsibilities and expertise. Uh, when the COVID uh, came in, uh, it's, though it's a halt uh, challenge or is a halt crisis, it is also a humanitarian crisis, and uh, my ministry was at the forefront of addressing these issues to see how we take humanitarian interventions to these uh, vulnerable groups, especially the internally displaced persons, uh, the refugees who are in our country who already are vulnerable and then have become more vulnerable, and then those who have become vulnerable again, for instance, the uh, daily uh, wage and as the urban and peri-urban uh, population where we have to now find a way to see how we can support them, especially during uh, the lockdown. So Nigeria is uh, trying very well to see that these issues were addressed and these issues were addressed in a very uh, comprehensive and coordinated manner. Okay, so something for you to keep in mind that we can circle back to is when we talk about what happens next, because nobody wants to be a refugee forever, how do they transcend their situation, whether they are an internally displaced person or they're somebody who has crossed from across the border. When we come back to you a little bit later on, just keep it in mind, I wonder what the plan is and what measures there might be for that moving forward. As we go along here, I want to get opening statements for ev from everybody here on the panel, and then I hope that everybody can interact with each other and maybe even ask some questions of each other if they, if they so wish. Um, Kerem Kinnick, there's a very beautiful poem from the uh, Somali-British uh, poet, I think Somali-British, Warsan Shire, nobody puts their children in the boat unless the ocean is safer than the land. As this migration and refugee crisis has unfolded over the years, a lot of people in a lot of countries have believed that migrants have a choice, that these people are not coming to safer land, that they're coming for, for reasons other than fleeing to safety. It has emerged in, in different phenomena in different countries. And, I'm, and I guess it happens with, with economic stress, it happens when, when demagogues and, and, and political leaders uh, say so. From your position, how difficult does that aspect make it for you when you're trying to do the humanitarian work and help people who are on the move? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you are right. Uh, and. We are facing as humanity the largest and uh, complex and protracted ever uh, population movement. Regardless, regular or irregular migrants or refugees for displaced internally or externally uh, movement, but many, many uh, root causes of those population movements. And if we want to treat this illness, we have to diagnose rightly the first. Uh, yes, economical reasons for migrants. Yes, conflicts. 
international armed conflicts, interstate armed, armed conflicts. Uh, we have active, almost 100 active armed conflicts. Uh, mass majority of them between inter non-state armed groups. And uh, the, the conflicts of, the habit of the conflicts nowadays in content, temporary area changed uh, the their, their uh, I mean, environment. Actually, uh, before 18th century, uh, arms uh, 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 conflicts was between armies, mm. far away from the civil societies and uh, urban areas. Then uh, it shifted to the international uh, conflicts. Nowadays, we are witnessing proxy war, subcontracted armed conflicts. So many states supporting some non-state armed groups to protect their interests in different areas and uh, it brought uh, to new uh, era a complex and protracted humanitarian crisis. So uh, if we compare crises and tensions in the world and preventive measures and international uh, interventions and uh, international interventions is so weak. In terms of uh, security policy making processes, in terms of delivering humanitarian assistance, in terms of today we are celebrating World Hum Human Rights Day. So uh, it's really difficult to say international community or mankind uh, are able to protect human rights fully all over the world. So we as humanitarians are struggling uh, with lack of finance, mid-term and long-term financing of our programs to protect dignity and provide humanitarian uh, basic, even basic assistance, shelter, food, healthcare, education, and other things uh, to people in need. And in many conflict areas, our uh, humanitarian actors open to danger. There is no international protection uh, because the armed groups, generally non-state armed groups, and it's really difficult to expect from them to imply, uh, apply international humanitarian law or those kind of international regulations, it's really difficult. Uh, so uh, there is no protection, umbrella upon uh, humanitarian act actors. And uh, it's not only for, for uh, the, the root cause is so complex, not only armed conflicts, climate change, uh, sexual uh, violence, gender-based violence, uh, unfair, I mean, uh, sharing uh, the, the capitals or lack of governance of the uh, states, many things. Uh, so, our, but uh, our problems, all our problems mainly global and solutions must be global. It means uh, the states and international community and mankind, the societies, intellectuals, academicians must collaborate each other for elevating the suffering and protecting dignity of mankind and saving the future. And the problem lies in the fact that some people are sympathetic to some refugees, but not others. Some migrants are not others for nationalistic or ideological or whatever reasons. And that's something we can, we can get into as we go along. Gillian Triggs, ma'am, I first came across a lot of your work when you were outspoken in Australia related to the situation in Manus and Nauru, People were suffering on those islands offshore. You were very outspoken about the government policy there. You're now on the international stage where it's not only the context of what was happening in Australia, but you have, you have the opportunity to see the parallels elsewhere in the world. And is it the ugly reality that there are many parallels with that situation in Australia all over the world? Um, and may I say what a huge pleasure it is to be here in Istanbul. And it is, of course, as, as you quite correctly say, the uh, uh, Human Rights Day. 
Hmm. And if we have a solution, it's got to, to bring us back to those fundamental principles of human rights. But yes, I think um, the, the, the key issue, and, I th and, and the Minister for, for Nigeria has really made the point very well, and that is we have unprecedented levels of conflict internally and, and across national borders. We have 103 million people displaced uh, within a country, including, of course, Nigeria, uh, but uh, we also have um, very high numbers uh, uh, crossing borders, and, of course, the war in Ukraine has, has amplified those numbers uh, significantly. So we have, uh, we have extraordinary numbers that the United Nations and the UN Refugee Agency has never met before, uh, and numbers that pose a huge threat to the asylum system, which is really our job to protect. Um, we now find a willingness for countries to disregard the right of every person to claim asylum, whether they're granted it, of course, depends on proper process. Uh, so we have threats to asylum, we have pushbacks, we have denials of access to protection in a way that I think we've never seen before. But equally, in a very complex world, we have some of the most uh, uh, inspiring examples of protection. Uh, we have Colombia offering uh, nearly two many million people um, uh, a temporary protection for 10 years and a pathway to citizenship. Uh, we have the very particular problem of, of countries that are dealing with internally displaced uh, in, in the millions. We have the war in Ukraine with um, nearly 7 million displaced within the country and nearly 8 million displaced externally. But we have the European uh, Temporary Protection Directive, which is uh, unique, really, offering uh, an immediate level of protection, um, along with um, other examples such as Colombia offering 10 years uh, a residency permit and a pathway uh, for the Venezuelans. So uh, there are some very good examples, but I think possibly um, the politicization of migration and refugee needs is one of the greatest challenges. The other being uh, a lack of budgets, um, and I think that's been mentioned. It is a huge problem, but we have as big a budget today as we've ever had, and yet the gap between the need and the budgets is continuing to grow. And much of that funding, of course, has come from Africa, uh, from uh, North Central America, from, from uh, other programs around the world to Ukraine. And one of the things that we need to do is to put the spotlight back on, on where we have long, uh, and the word's been used, protracted conflicts, hmm. where there are no solutions in sight. Um, and if I can conclu conclude, may sure. I say that the, the aspect that I think is inspiring for us uh, is that the solution lies in the, uh, a multilateral approach, and that point has been made. Uh, we have the Global Compact on Refugees and the Global Compact on Migration, and we can start to deal with the elements that the Minister has mentioned, the phenomenon of mixed movements. We, we have groups that, are, that might be migrants looking for a better opportunity in life, leaving poverty and inequality, but we also have others leaving clear cases of conflict and persecution. Uh, where, where we need to find solutions. And I think we will only do that together through the multilateral system and through that really inspiring principle of the compacts, which is the equitable sharing of the burdens and responsibilities uh, for people seeking international protection. How do you do that in the multilateral system when the, the pinnacle of that would be the UN Security Council and you have members who fundamentally disagree on the causes of conflicts, on the solutions to conflicts, or even whether those who suffer as a result of the conflict are indeed suffering, or whether it's safe for them to return home, and so on. Because when you, the devil's in the details, right? It's political actors who have to make political decisions in order for multilateralism to work. Is there a ceiling to what you can do as a humanitarian? Well, actually, we, we are very, uh, very pleased by the, the title of this session, which is Beyond Humanitarianism. Mm. Um, and, and what we mean by that, and hopefully you do too, is that of course we're a humanitarian organisation and we must first and form, foremost provide protection. But equally we know that the solutions lie working with development actors, with the World Bank, with the private sector, um, and working towards peace and peace initiatives. Your question is a good one. How do you, how do you respond to these issues when we're dealing with sovereign nations in the Security Council with five permanent members that can use a veto. How are we ever going to resolve it? And I would suggest that one way forward is uh, the multilateralism through the compacts, which are not dependent totally on states, 
In other words, sovereign nations are, of course, uh, the, arguably the most important members, but what's important about the compacts is that they're not legal documents, they're aspirational towards global sharing, but it's a whole of society uh, oh, approach, right. and that's why a meeting, right. a forum of this kind is so important. We now have the World Bank, we have the, the African Development Bank, uh, we have civil society, faith-based groups, parliamentarians, scholars that we have with us today. Uh, we have all the, uh, uh, the uh, non-governmental organisations, the big organisations, the, 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 the Red Crescent, uh, uh, the, the International Committee of the Red Cross and so on. What I'm suggesting is that we, we, of course, we have the structure under the United Nations Charter and the principles of human rights law, but we now have a softer system mm. where, without legally binding obligations, you have a commitment to achieving joint whole of society and whole of international community responses. And I, I'd suggest that this is the way forward, uh, working across our communities and coming together and working to support governments in dealing with the huge problems that they have to address today with uh, the point that's already been made, non-armed groups. So we're not mm. dealing with classical wars in mm. the main, although of course we have a major one on our hands at the moment. Mm. And what is a government or, or, or a nation but a collection of individuals and, and small little subgroups, right? So putting pressure on, on those at the top to make certain decisions. Kurt de Boeuf, we've heard a lot of depressing stuff <laughs> here. I mean, we had some glimmers from, from Gillian as well, but it doesn't sound as if we're in a good place. One, one would have thought that reaching the year 2022, we would not, n not have ongoing conflicts such as the situation in Ukraine, we would not have ongoing refugee crises, we would not have tens of millions of people displaced around the world, but we do, we are where we are. Give me something to hold on to that is positive about what's being done to fix the situation. Well, let me first say I'm, I'm, I'm not just an academic, I've also been around and have seen, in, seen quite a lot of refugee situations and my uh, in Egypt, in Syria, uh, in Turkey, uh, certainly in the south and in Lebanon and so forth, but also in Europe. I live in Brussels where I've seen, well, that, that migration, I mean, what, what, it, what it brings about. Um, I would say there's, there's a lot of agreement and there's a lot of studies that talk about the causes of migration, which is, as I said, mostly conflict. Uh, also future causes of migration, which is going to be climate change and so forth, uh, droughts from uh, which is already happening, uh, of course. There's quite some studies about the, what migration is causing, and which is mostly formulated in the, well, let's say, the word disruption. So it's seen as a big problem, as a crisis, like uh, we say we've seen the last seven years, migration is the biggest crisis since the Second World War. But one thing that has been, I think, understudied is, is what brings migration on the longer term to a society, to the world? And uh, let, let me start with a, a, a very open door uh, statement, which is, of course, we, we are all migrants coming from Africa <laughs> two million years ago. Uh, I know it's a very long time ago, but just imagine a world without migration, a history without migration. But the United States would not have existed. Turkey would have never been Turkey. So, I mean, most of the countries in the world are the product of migration one way or another. And I know this all sounds a bit like ancient history, even though some things are really 20th century uh, stuff. But I live in Brussels where 60% uh, of the population living in Brussels is not born in Belgium. 60%. Not all of them are migrants or refugees, of course. But the question is, I mean, what would a country or a city where a lot of different people come together from different backgrounds, some from their will, or the ones pushed by conflict or economic uh, reasons. And many see Brussels as a problem, you know? So Brussels is, 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 I mean, there was a, the, the game, football game where the Morocco won and there was some fights in the street. It was all not big, but it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was seen as a massive problem. But what I see in a city like Brussels, what I see in a city like Istanbul or Cairo, also where I live, is that where there's a lot of people coming together, there's a lot of energy coming out. And I think that 
We've been talking about the politicization of migration, and it's always seen as a bad and dangerous thing. And we will come back to it, I think, in, 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 in with other questions. Uh, but this politicization is always seen as the extreme say it's extremely bad, it's dangerous for our society, while the others say, well, we'll try to manage and so forth. And we, but nobody is, is looking into what are the positive aspects of it. And I think there are many, and I think there are many unknown. And that's perhaps one aspect that we should all look better into, look beyond the, dis the disruption, I would say. Mm. Although you're saying that the world was shaped by migration, some of the greatest cities in the world were shaped by migration, that's true. That's a fact. But we're in a situation where that's down the line if we take our current situation and people are in refugee camps, people are in horrible conditions, they're not wanted in certain places, um, cities and countries, the, the, their fundamental social dynamics that are restless right now. So how do we get from this one, this one thing to the other thing where, can, where we can say, oh, this is a wonderful multicultural city shaped by the migration of Syrians that happened in the 2010s, the migration of Ukrainians that happened you know, from that war and so on and so forth. How do, we, how do we smooth that process to allow for that absorption of migration and refugees into society to add to the richness of, of humanity? And I guess that's, that's for anyone to tackle here. Who wants to have a go? Go ahead, Kurt. Let me take it theoretically. Yeah. I mean, is that why do we have refugee camps? because they are not welcome in the cities. Mm. <laughs> and that actually has been always the case. The ones who lived in the city didn't welcome the new guys, but they came anyway. And then they became part of the city, didn't welcome immediately the new guys, and so forth. And it's a continuing process of renewal that eventually shapes the city. And that's how it's gonna be. People can't live forever in refugee camps. I mean, whoever has visited refugee camps, that's the place you don't want to be. So it depends, I'm imprisoned in a way, in some way or another and there's no future. So there has to be a solution, and the solution is only absorption, going beyond the disruption scheme. But I think that, that it is happening anyway, but let's try to figure out the story, how this right. has happened in the past, and how this can work in the future. Okay, and I guess let me then sort of alter that question a little bit. Kerem Kinnik, some, for some people, the solution is send them back to their home countries. And that, that's... Th that is a position that is very hard, it's very synonymous in many ways with political demagoguery and, and populism. That's an ugly solution as well, in many ways. Tell me how you take the problem that we have right now and we transcend it into making it something livable moving, moving forward. Uh, according to facts and figures by 2020, is we have 200 71 million migrants, and by the Ukrainian crisis, 100 million refugees, forcibly displaced people nowadays. 60% uh, of total migrants living in or seeking refuge or taking shelter in developed countries, which is normal, is economical reasons. The 40% of migrants still in the developing countries uh, upon uh, IDPs or refugees, it's a, a kind of burden on developing countries uh, as well. Besides uh, all those facts and figures, and we have, we will celebrate by 17th December uh, the, the fourth anniversary of Global Compact, uh, uh, Compact on Refugees, uh, and it, it, it's a kind of international initiative and declaration upon uh, refugees to protect uh, their rights and dignity, to support host communities, and to ease voluntarily returning process to uh, origin countries, and uh, to support uh, resettlement of uh, refugees or migrants to third countries. But uh, what's, what's the outcome of this uh, compact? Actually, uh, only 34,400 34, people resettled uh, in third countries. So, what else? By the last year, we have 6,000 dead killing their countries, the migrants. So, uh, this system and this 
agreement and treaties uh, are not able to protect basic human rights. And yes, pushbacks or uh, rising up the walls or uh, rising up the tension domestically, politically and internationally, polarization and hate speech and real hard uh, policy making uh, against uh, the uh, migrants and refugees. But in the meantime, we are uh, actually monitoring the situation. It's a kind of targeted uh, migrant recruitment policies. Well trained, well skilled hmm. people, also mostly welcome. You're talking about mainly Western industrialized nations yes. targeting yes, because, uh, if migrants. The, the, uh, the, Qualified. Yeah, yeah, the route is yeah. mainly from south to north and right. uh, east to west. It means the developing countries. And uh, those part of the world is aging world hmm. and need manpower and right. educated power. But in the meantime, it's a leakage of origin countries. I'm hmm. the brain, doctors, in, uh, engineers, artists, uh, scholars. So they are absorbing and they are losing. So it is a kind of intellectual property that they are losing. Mm. And it is a kind of value for the developing countries. It's not the mig migration. It's not the humanitarian policy. It's a kind of development policy, mm. unfair development policy. But in the meantime, it's the real uh, and the fact, actually. Uh, so uh, many countries, yeah, Hungary, uh, established by uh, the the Turkish population, hung Hungarian, coming from the Central Asia. So it's it's fact. Uh, but in the meantime, we need to uh, reach common understanding as all humanity, how we will protect uh, people on move, and how we how we will stop criminals smuggling or human trafficking or other well-established and innovative networks. These industries that build yeah, up around really it. Right. Industry. right. So uh, we need holistic approach. Right. Um, and, and Minister Sadia Omar Farouk, you were nodding in, in agreement there. When, when Kerem Kinnik mentioned countries having this dual problem of losing people and having to absorb people, yes. I'm assuming Nigeria has to grapple with that. Yes, uh, that's, that's very correct. I was nodding to that because once we stop looking at uh, migration and displacement just as mere numbers. Uh, they are reflective of uh, the changing nature of the world today. Uh, therefore, anti-immigration is not uh, productive and is not an option. As you rightly mentioned, uh, the other part of the world now is losing their labor force because of aging, mm. and then the developing countries have such very huge population of a labor force that uh, can be tapped into. And this is where we say migration uh, cannot uh, be uh, stopped, but we want to focus on regular migration, labor exchange, for instance, between the developing and the developed countries, so that this can be done in a very, very coordinated way. And uh, we have labor exchange. Our youth can go to this part of the world for a better uh, life in a very regular way, in a safe, orderly, and uh, regular manner. Is it not happening in that way it right now? It is not happening, and that is why, and because even of the v stringent visa policies of these uh, developed uh, countries, it makes it almost impossible uh, for these uh, migrants to follow the uh, proper channel uh, to migrate to, this, to these countries. And this is where we are having discussions around how we can have this uh, regular, coordinated uh, manner of you know, labor exchange and regular uh, migration. And once that is done, I'm sure we'll be able to curb this issue of irregular migration. On the issue of uh, uh, displacement, be it internally or externally, IDPs or refugees, I think countries have to really sit and address the root causes of these problems. Most of it are 
you know, developmental, economic reasons why people uh, decide to take laws into their hands. And once governments address these issues, I think we'll be able to reduce to some extent the issue of uh, this crisis that gives rise to, give birth to, to, to displacement. And then, after displacement, what next? We must uh, shift away from just giving uh, humanitarian support. And that is why this, the, the, the theme for this forum is very apt. We have to now uh, focus on the durable solution aspect on how we're going to support, because as rightly mentioned, refugees will not be refugees forever. Displaced communities or displaced people will not continue to be displaced. But what measures are put in place to see that these people uh, are returned back uh, to their communities in mm. safety, in dignity? People rebuild their lives. You know, you support them with livelihoods. You know, and then so that uh, they are able to fend for themselves and members of their families. So durable solution is very, very, very important. And then on the issue of uh, you know, camping, Nigeria has a policy, a non-encampment policy for refugees. Our refugees, refugees who come into Nigeria are not camped, except in very, 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 very uh, rare occasions where you know, the terrain is very difficult to reach, to assist, uh, to support. But as a policy, as a government, we do not uh, camp our refugees. Our refugees are allowed to go into the society, uh, reintegrate, and we support them with livelihood uh, support. Uh, as a country, we do not camp refugees who come into the country. You speak of durable solutions long term, whether people want to resettle back where they came from or they want to be absorbed into the society, live dignified lives. Do you have the budget and do you have the political will in your country well, for that? Well, we do have the political will. Oh, the government under the leadership of His Excellency President Muhammad Buhari is very committed to that. Uh, for instance, in the northeastern part of the country where we have this insurgency issue, the issue of the Boko Haram insurgency, uh, the government has uh, created different uh, platforms and agencies whose mandate is to really address the issue of this durable solution, recovery, reintegration, resettlement, rehabilitation of this uh, mm. affected uh, population that have been displaced. For instance, we have the North East Development Commission, which is under the purview of my ministry, and the mandate, the core mandate of that agency is to rebuild, is to recover, is to resettle uh, these, these, these displaced communities back into their, uh, into their uh, communities in safety and in dignity, those places that uh, is safe to return. We have started returning them. We have uh, rebuilt their houses. We have uh, put in place infrastructures that mm -hmm. you know, will accommodate their, their, their yearnings and their aspirations. Right. And that's encouraging. My colleague Minkailu over there has mentioned that we have five minutes left. I don't know where the time flew. So I'm going to try my very best to get us moving here. Gillian Triggs, what is the most important question that we need to ask or we're failing to ask right now? Well, I think we have to come to terms with the reality that resettlement and returns to unstable and dangerous places is not realistic. So we have to come to terms with the fact that most people, and, and as the minister said, they're, they're, they're migrants, they're refugees, but they won't be forever. They simply become part of the community. And I'd like to take up the point that the professor has made that, that we have to place a stronger emphasis on the, on the riches they bring, the cultural uh, um, and enterprise uh, and uh, skills that they bring to the communities in which they work. Um, but I think the really important question that we now need to uh, look at more deeply is root causes. We, will, we cannot keep doing what we're doing. Uh, next year we will report more people and the year after we'll report even more. So the, we have as a, as a global community to face the reality of looking at 
poverty, inequality, especially gender inequality, of course conflict and violence. Um, and we have to work on this together. But that involves, to a very significant degree, the transfer of significant development and investment funds to those countries uh, that need, need to adjust to those root causes. So we want to work with host communities like Turkey, the, the largest uh, uh, host community in the world, uh, nearly four million people. Uh, they have to be supported, and other countries, uh, of, of course, take, take, take uh, not dissimilar numbers. Um, we have to adjust to, to, the, to those realities. But eventually, the, the issue is going to be to ensure that we've invested to stabilize populations and to create an environment in which people are not having to move uh, from the south to the north and the east to the west. It's unsustainable and, uh, and it's, not, it, it's not addressing the, the fundamental uh, mm. issues. And I think because of the sheer dimension of the problem that we're dealing with today, uh, I think we, we're more able to discuss this sensibly. And so a forum like this is very, very welcome because it raises an awareness and, and each of the points that my, my fellow panelists have made is right, uh, but we have to work together. Karim, yes. is there a common denominator in your, in your mind that is the root cause or that are the root causes that are clear to you and should be universally accepted by everybody? Uh, we are, as humans, not an, only an organic mechanisms. We have spirit and we have values, moral values. We have uh, traditions and we have identities, social identities and universal identities. If we lost our values, it means uh, we are acting a, a kind of animals, hunting, gathering and taking refuge without moral values and other things. But we have to have common moral values as humanity if we want to survive in this planet. And uh, it is uh, really uh, serious uh, risks for all uh, mankind in the world. Uh, we will face uh, near future by large number of the disasters and conflicts if we don't change our mindset. And uh, the root cause, root cause is nowadays, yes, several, but we, uh, we will have uh, new causes upon this existing one. And if we act together, actually COVID-19 pandemics was an opportunity for us, but we lose it. Hmm. Uh, global solidarity, I mean. Well, we had it for a short while, <laughs> and then we went re reverted to factory settings. <laughs> of course. Uh, so, I mean, uh, we, we, we have to have global, uh, global understanding and global protection mechanism. If everybody is not in safe place, nobody is safe. safe. Hmm. So we have to provide equal and worldwide protection and honest uh, policies for everyone, for health coverage, for right. food security, for climate-related uh, policies, uh, honestly and openly. Uh, Kurt de Boeuf, very finely, I see that it sometimes takes for these very extreme emotional moments, um, usually in the media, usually things that are are shared ubiquitously on social media, shocking images such as the awful image of that young boy, Alan Kurdi, three years old, washed up on the beach in 2015, for people to start to care. And then they care for a little while, and then it tapers off again. If there is some sort of lesson that we can draw from that about us as human beings, but also media when they talk about migrants and refugees, what is that lesson? that our caring for others based on media thing is very short term. But I do believe that people in general have this tendency really to care about each other if they are not dehumanized, if they remain human, having a human face. So it's always the same, the refugee next to you is the good one and the one that you don't know is the dangerous one. So I mean, 
So maybe we should take care more, I mean, bringing people, giving more a human face, get less words. I would like would to, to, to give a long discourse about conflict, but I would say people are people and just let's trick, let's get them closer to each other, more dialogue and uh, less talking about identity and more about people themselves. Well, that's very beautiful. And I always think that sometimes we don't listen to the refugees themselves, but we want to listen to the politician talking about refugees, about their intentions. So we'd have Matteo Salvini saying, those refugees are coming here for blah, 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 for these reasons to take our jobs and so on. But nobody ever asks the refugee, why are you coming? And, and that's our fault as media as well, because it's a sexy headline to go to Salvini because he's going to say some, some crazy stuff, right? And, and, and that's on us and we can do better. If anybody wants to add a final comment, go ahead before I wrap up. Anybody here, Minister? Well, I just want to say that um, it is important to note that uh, combating this issue of mixed migration requires a multi-stakeholder approach. And this is what each and every one of us here has mentioned. It, it requires multi-stakeholder engagement in a comprehensive and coordinated uh, manner, multidisciplinary manner, and also to say that we should be highly committed to Objective 23 of the uh, Global Compact on Migration for Regular uh, Migration for Orderly Migration and also the Global Compact on refugees. Once we're committed to this objective, we'll be able to address these issues of mixed migration. Yeah, we hope that governments and stakeholders take this seriously. Anybody else want to add anything very finely? Just for resources. Okay, yeah, final comments. Sorry, guys, we're running late. Blame me. Final states, comments from everybody. States must uh, give back to migrants resources mm. as much as he got from migrants. Mm. Actually, uh, if we compare our humanitarian sector budget, less than 100 billion. If you compare with, I mean, the uh, pet food sector, 150 billion, uh, cosmetic sector, 400 billion. So it's really a shame to have this kind of small, uh, I mean, scale uh, budget as total humanitarian landscape. Julian? I'd just like to add uh, to, the, to the minister's point, um, orderly, coherent migration labor mobility, education, family reunion, community sponsorship at the local level, listening to the voices of refugees. Uh, if we can concentrate on that part of the puzzle, that will strengthen the asylum part of the puzzle for those people who are fleeing conflict and persecution. So the two compact pacts work really well, and I think, frankly, if we can make them work uh, with the right spirits of solidarity, I truly believe we can start to uh, get a better, better solution to this and avoid the politicization. Thank Beautiful. you. Beautiful. Beautiful. I'd like to come back just to the conflict. I mean, the, the, the real root con is, of course, conflict. And we want less conflict, but we, uh, we know where the next conflicts might be. Might be again in Libya, might be Sudan, might be uh, Iran, might indeed be again with or with China, without China, I mean, in Taiwan. But, but we don't see less war rhetoric, we see it increasing and uh, less caring about what is going on. And I think what is really, what really needs to happen is, and I'm coming back to what the foreign minister said this morning, is we need a new dialogue, a new leadership and stop this war rhetoric, otherwise things will get out of hand pretty quickly, pretty heavily. Yep. The number one creator of migrants and refugees is war. And it's, that's on the politicians. Here's to a more caring and equitable and compassionate and humane world. I thank you all for joining us. I'm so sorry we have run over time, out of time, but thank you. Thank you.